Our next presentation is Intersections of Stigma, Mental Health, and Sex Work, How Canadian Men Engaged in Sex Work Navigate and Resist, resist Stigma to Protect Their Mental Health. Um, it's going to be being presented to us by Sunny Zhao of the University of BC. Uh, Sunny completed her Bachelor of Science in Nursing Studies in 2012 with a focus in psychiatric nursing and has been working as a registered nurse at a local hospital. She also completed Masters of Health Administration Studies and is now a first-year doctoral student at the UBC School of Nursing. Mental health and substance use are Sunny's areas of passion and are facets of health she believes warrant greater attention and system supports. Sunny's interested in engaging in research related to the promotion of health equity for individuals affected by mental illness and or substance use through improving service provision and delivery. Uh, please welcome Sunny to the podium. Hi everyone, I'm so privileged to be able to be here today to share my research um, and to be part of this amazing panel. So uh, the topic of my research today is mental health, um, especially among uh, Canadian men engaged in sex work. I will specifically be focusing on stigma as experienced by this population as well as the protective strategies that they use to help protect their mental health. Just to start with a little bit of background, so um, individuals who are um, engaged in sex work are among one of the most stigmatized populations. Um, men in sex work may be especially subject to stigma as they may experience multiple sources of stigma, including exchanging sex for money as well as having sex with other men. In addition, with the shift towards indoor sex work, uh, workers are increasingly working in isolation where it might be difficult for them to rely on a sense of community to protect them from the effects of stigma. This impact is actually illustrated in the city of Vancouver itself, where the loss of boys down here um, due to displacement uh, and gentrification of the street-based workers resulted in the loss of social connection, support, and also a loss of community solidarity. There is also research suggesting that the very nature of sex work, uh, which includes the emotional and sexual demands of the work, also have the potential to jeopardize mental health. Uh, where workers uh, may have trouble differentiating work and personal life, as well as clients and pr private partners. Um, workers may feel the need to establish boundaries with clients in both a physical and emotional sense. And these strategies also serve to help them counter the effects of stigma through an occupational lens. Um, however, in the Canadian context, there's largely a lack of research as to how men engaged in sex work, especially how indoor workers experience stigma, navigate stigma, and counter stigma. These gaps in knowledge um, hinder the design and implementation of services that are targeted towards this population, and there is a need for further understanding for both the needs of the men as well as the capacities that they have uh, in related to mental health promotion. So this is the purpose of this research, is to generate knowledge um, to inform the development of both catered and appropriate services. So um, the project has three main objectives. Uh, the first is to examine the interrelationships between stigma and mental health for indoor-based Canadian um, male sex workers. And second is to understand how stigma experienced by workers affect their mental health. And lastly, to examine the strategies that are employed by workers in order to mitigate against the effects of stigma. 
Um, so my uh, research is actually a little part of a bigger study uh, called the Spaces Study. And um, it is a large ethnographic study uh, with spaces um, stands for sex, power, agency, consent, environment, and safety. Uh, this is a project that examines the working conditions of indoor sex workers and how this is related to their health and safety. So although the larger study encompasses um, people of diverse gender identities, for the purposes of this work, this is a secondary analysis of the interview transcripts of just a subset of the men and specifically 33 qualitative interviews um, were analyzed. Uh, just a little bit about um, our sample. So all of the men identified as working independently um, without an agency. And many um, advertise through online means. So that means uh, dating websites, social network websites, as well as classified websites. Um, out of the 33 men, uh, 24 identified as white. And 24 also um, identified as being under the age of 40. And with about one third of our sample um, having had less identified um, as having less than five years in the industry. Uh, most of the men um, identified as providing services to other men, but this was definitely not exclusive. In terms of um, our findings, there are um, three broad categories. The first is uh, the intersection of stigma and work. And the second is um, how the men navigate the stigma. And the third is some recommendations for service provision. So in our analysis, we found several noteworthy intersections between stigma and sex work. Uh, particularly, we noted that discrimination was a very significant aspect of the men's experiences, and being identified as a worker led to judgment as unworthy and as someone that others could justly publicly ridicule. The men also talked about people within their social networks pointing and staring at them in public, and workers were also mocked in social settings often by people they did not even know directly, uh, such as at the gym. Stigma meant that the men lost privacy and also lost normalcy in their lives, um, such as when they were just spending time with their friends. Uh, men talked about clients approaching them in public and essentially outing them. And once they were outed, they felt very socially rejected. And also, they felt that their support networks were lost. So this is illustrated uh, by a quote of one of our participants. He said, if you're trying to go out to have some fun with some friends, and then this stranger comes up to you, and he's offering you all this money and telling you these things he wants to do, your friends hear all of it, and then they are gone because they don't want to be friends anymore. Stigma also affected the men's capacities to both initiate and sustain romantic relationships. Um, as uh, some dating websites are, have the option of also identifying yourself as a worker in terms of advertising purposes, um, the label of sex worker was actually taken to mean that the men were somehow unable to be authentic partners and unable to have an authentic relationship. Also, um, some existing romantic partners also resented the intimate nature of the work and also were unhappy about the disruptions that were associated with the uh, unpredictable work schedules associated with the work in order to provide sufficient income for the person. Uh, this is another quote from one of the men uh, talking about this. 
uh, they resent you for it. A lot of times we would be cuddling, having a movie night, and then I get the call. And he'd hate that. He knew the situation. I never hid anything from him. But because I'm out screwing, it kind of gets twisted in his head. Strategies that the men uh, employed to help protect their mental health and to counter stigma were varied. Um, some of the men avoided trying to be, um, avoided being the target of stigma. So they focus uh, largely on trying to hide their work and trying to prevent uh, from being outed. So for instance, um, they did not post pictures of their face or identifying features on a public website um, or on websites. And um, they had a separate telephone for work purposes. Um, this this um, constant stress and also fear of others finding about their work uh, meant that the men became socially avoidant and also very isolated. And some were actually really reluctant to even reach out to services because they've had, they, they're, they're very fearful of being stigmatized. As one of the men told us, reaching out and being open, sometimes it is hard because whether you're aware of it or not, people talk. If this friend is having a conversation on the telephone and something slips, and before you know it, people put two and two together and they know what's going on without you ever having to say anything. I still don't feel like I can trust people. I've learned that people can be very mean. Other men uh, chose to out themselves selves to friends and reframe this rejection as uh, essentially a filtering process whereby they're able to find friends that are able to accept them uh, regardless of what they did for a living. Uh, still, others um, use the strategy of trying to avoid the people that were judgmental and try to belittle them. Some of the men uh, counter stigma through trying to set boundaries with their clients. So they talked about both uh, trying to control the type of client that they will see, as well as the type of services that they're uh, willing to provide. Um, they conveyed that they had rights, just like people with normal jobs, in that they're able to uh, reject aspects of their work that made them feel uncomfortable. And at the same time, uh, they said that the clients should be respectful of their boundaries. Men also set um, boundaries in an emotional sense by avoiding an emotional entanglement uh, with clients where they try to refuse to see clients outside of work time. Um, this is enabled establishment of a distance emotionally so that when the client nobody, um, no one no uh, longer wants to see them, um, then they would not have uh, a hard time. In addition, um, how the men saw their work as in a positive or a negative light also seemed to matter. So a few of the men in our sample uh, viewed the work as a very important service where they were uh, being helpful and they took pride in uh, being emotionally connected with the client at the moment. And this is a quote from one of the men. You have to open yourself up physically, emotionally, to whoever walks through your door pretty much. And it's about staying present. This is who I am. This is what I'm providing. And that attracts a certain type of person who is nice and in need of a quality experience with somebody who is willing to put their heart into their work. Um, Unfortunately, this strategy was not 
adopted by all participants, particularly for the men that who felt they were dependent on sex work for survival purposes. Um, instead, they were extremely distressed and um, verbalized that every time they saw a client, they felt like uh, they were selling a piece of themselves. And um, they reported in having to engage in cognitive dissonance strategies whereby they describe their work as mechanical and robotic. In terms of um, service provision, uh, the men voiced that existing services were very helpful. At the same time, they note that there is a severe lack of the availability of the services, where um, there has been a recent loss to the outreach workers and also in the reduction of hours of, of ability of the people who are able to help them. Overall, the men identified one source of support as the most important, and that is having and maintaining social connections with other workers, peers, in the industry. Peers were understood to be non-judgmental and able to understand what the men were going through, especially in the context of stigma. There's, there was an overwhelming need for formal peer support networks, either through health or social uh, agencies. There was also a voice need uh, for programming that addresses the targeted men, uh, targeted needs of the men in the industry. To summarize, uh, Canadian men engaged in sex work ex experience significant stigma related to their work, which in turn subjects them to suboptimal sub mental health conditions. At the same time, however, enactments of stigma uh, has consequences for their support systems and also for their ability to form non-commercial romantic relationships thereby depriving the men of some of the resources that they actually need to cope. It is also clear that the men are acutely aware of the impact of stigma on their mental health and are incredibly proactive and creative in trying to counter them. However, they do require um, help from the larger system. Overall, um, for the purposes of the mental health uh, service provision, it's important to focus on needs that are targeted and also build on existing capacities of the men in support of mental health promotion. And I just want to take the time to acknowledge um, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research for funding the larger project within which this uh, small subject is a part of. And I want to acknowledge the larger uh, spaces project investigative team as well as our advisory committee. But perhaps uh, most importantly, I want to say thank you to the 33 men who took the time to talk to us and to share their stories. And I also want to thank my supervisor and my collaborating for this work, uh, Dr. Vicky Bangi, who has been amazing throughout this entire process. Thank you uh, all again for this opportunity to share my findings and to be able to learn from all of you. Um, if you're interested in this basis project or other work that's done as part of our research unit, uh, here's the website. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great, thanks. So any questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Chad Dickey from AIDS Vancouver Island in Victoria. A couple of questions. In your demo, de demographic da data, did you uh, measure the rate of substance use for the, the, the participants? And also, in your qualitative analysis, did you look for escape motivation and its influences on substance use and or risk modification behavior? 
Um, in our data, um, substance use was not uh, something that was arranged as a pre, um, pre question, so to speak. Uh, the men talked about it if they wished to. So we don't have sort of a demographic statistic of how, how many of the men um, are using, currently using, used in the past. Um, in terms of substance use, um, for the purposes of this research, we only focused on the mental health aspect. Uh, but we realize there is a very um, important and um, intertwined relationship between substance use and mental health. And um, actually, as part of my master's project, uh, this is um, actually an expansion of my master's project where I expanded, uh, where I talked about uh, a smaller sample of the men. And as part of that project, I did talk a little bit about the substance use aspect of it. And um, in that, we see uh, that substance use can uh, have several functions for the men. Um, and, um, and at the same time, they, um, there are definitely strategies that the men identified in terms of uh, being to use substances in a more safe uh, manner. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just wondering, because the escape motivation is such a part of that teasing out of why a person may uh, use because of the stigma, because of self-acceptance, because of all these other barriers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, intersectionalities. The one thing, uh, if they did a plain, if you do a plain language uh, of this, I think it would be fantastic. I think it would be well worth it to be able to be able to put your research into plain language so that uh, the people that need it the most and the people that can share it the most are, are able to use it. I think that would be great. Thank you very much. My name is Damon. Um, thank you so much for, for a great presentation. Um, I have to confess, so I, I practice therapy in most of my experience in New York City and San Francisco, and those are really bubbles where sex work and transactional, transactional sex are, are less stigmatized. There's certainly other issues, but stigma culturally seems to be less on the list. Um, my question for you and, and maybe for the participants in, in the study were, what, if anything, do you feel like could be done to help change the, change the culture, change the neighborhood, so that people having sex for transactional reasons mm -hmm. aren't subjected to the level of stigma or finger pointing or, or public humiliation here um, in a similar way that people who have transactional sex in other areas are not? Did that make sense? Did that come out right? In other words, what, uh, what could be done to change the society or, or um, the metaculture around um, people's views or, or discrimination about sex work? Right, <laughs> such a hard, hard question. <laughs> and, um, and I think, um, because I, I work in mental health, so mental health, um, in the larger um, field of mental health as well, we also have the issue of uh, prevailing stigma in the society where um, people are um, realize that they may need help, but because they don't want to be labeled by the system, um, they end up not actually uh, reaching out for services. Um, so I think in, uh, in the case of this population, um, this uh, change in attitude uh, may uh, be a bit of a long, long-term process. Um, but at the same time, um, as people who um, care for these people, uh, we are able to uh, given the resources, the limited resource that we do have um, to cater some services that would be um, helpful for them in the meanwhile um, through trying to establish services that they identify to be uh, particularly helpful. Um, for example, one, one of the men in our data had said um, a lot of services are catered towards women. Um, but there is very little that actually examines the need of gay workers, bisexual workers, you know, people with different um, gender identities as to what they need in terms of um, sex work. <laughs> yeah, 
and and um, in addition, uh, some have voiced that um, this uh, this um, societal attitude that somehow men don't need help as much as women do may also um, be impeding. Uh, the willingness of political powers in terms of um, funding and implementing services for this uh, population who very much needs them. I think we have time for one last question. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I was just thinking about from your presentation that obviously male sex workers are experiencing a high level of stigma related to transactional sex, but also to kind of intersectional identities. Yes. But basically what I'm interested in knowing is if you came across any kind of demographics about how frequent transactional sex is within LGBTQ community um, in the sense that uh, the degree of stigma that these individuals are experiencing is, is kind of equatable to what female sex workers would be experiencing, but the, there's the difference between the two populations that mm -hmm. I, I hypothesize that maybe transactional sex is happening more often within this community, but not being talked about and not known, mm -hmm. and therefore we could be doing something about stigma just simply by educating on, people on the fact that this is something that people do, it's something that happens, mm -hmm. and, and we shouldn't be stigmatizing it. So have you come across anything like that? Um, I haven't come across in terms of um, kind of statistics, um, uh, but I have um, read in the literature that um, some some of the men uh, try to counter stigma through thinking of it as um, as normal in the community. So I think that point is definitely um, uh, viable. Um, it's uh, for, but for the purposes of uh, this the data set that I was working with, um, I, I don't think I particularly um, identified this aspect of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sunny.